trading the CPI report. Um, again, the PPI came out this morning, uh, producer price index, and that was double what was expected. Uh, I you, you would think if that's double, you'd expect CPI to be higher too. Yeah. Um, because CPI see. is consumer. So if the producer yep. is up, you you imagine you see, you know, the s- consumer price index up. So uh, just a quick blurb on what the CPI is. It measures a monthly change in U.S. consumer prices. So it's important to understand it's, mo- you know, it comes out as a monthly number and then we look at it on a yearly basis. So the weighting here is going to be mostly in housing, commodities, food and energy. Commodities uh, that bucket includes like, you know, new cars, used cars, stuff like that. Housing, of course, has like rents built in there. Food is pretty self-explanatory. Um, energy is going to be like your gas, uh, natural gas and 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 uh, gasoline, all that stuff. And then, you know, you've got education, healthcare, transportation, and then other baked in there. Of course, this is used as a measure of uh, to gauge inflation. So you're looking at average changes in goods uh, for the consumer, uh, you know, over that period of time. And again, it's it's measured on a monthly basis. So you get this monthly print. So the current CPI, the year year over year CPI as of right now, or as of last report, which was last month, is eight is, a, you know, up 8.3%. But the CPI came in last month down two tenths of a percent, meaning from July to August, the the basket of of goods actually went down from the previous report. So inflation is still up on a year to year basis. But after last month's report, it actually came in two tenths of a percent. So it's important to understand if, you know, if the report comes in at at you know, down two tenths of a percent again, that doesn't mean that we've given up, you know, the 8% inflation that is currently there. It's just that it's gone from 8.3% to 8.1% year over year. Yeah, I think that uh, this slide in gas prices had a lot to do with the, of course, impact on that. Um, But yeah, love to see it. Uh, You love to see these binary events intraday. And these have been like, but back in the day, like three, four years ago, these, I couldn't even tell you when these happened because not, no one cared and it wasn't a huge deal. But now we're seeing that these are moving markets. You can see it right at 730 in the morning this morning. If you look at the one minute chart, the drop market dropped 30 points instantly. Why do you think that happened? It was because of this data. Um, yeah. It's not to say that you can like correlate you know it doesn't mean that if it comes in hot or if it comes in you know below expectations it doesn't yeah. indicate one way or the other in in terms of like the movement in the market but they it definitely does have you know short term effects uh on knee jerk reaction type trading yes just like any other uh binary event we don't know how the market will perceive the numbers Yes. Um, and that's, you know, just like earnings events when Tesla was burning millions and millions of dollars in cash, uh, pumping out negative earnings per share when they were less negative than expected, even though they were still losing tons of money, you would see the market just rip higher. So it's all about the perception of what these numbers are. But regardless, there is implied volatility. It's very much like an earnings volatility crush. So these concepts still apply to intraday binary events. And luckily, we have one-day options today, which will be zero-day options tomorrow. Those are the expirations we're going to use for our short options because we want the short option to not only get crushed by the implied volatility, the implied volatility effect will always have the biggest percentage uh, effect uh, on the zero-day options or the options that will be zero-day because all of that premium is implied volatility-based because there's no time value really. Um, this is really the only way you can be profitable on both the long and short options in a diagonal or calendar spread. I guess I shouldn't say only way, but uh, if you get a move to your strike or near your strike with a zero day option, it doesn't matter if it explodes intraday, it's going to zero extrinsic value by the end of the day. Mm. So if, if XSP, which is the product we're going to be using today, uh, if our if I do a calendar spread and XSP lands right 
like one point away from my strikes, if I do a five day or a 10 day long option, that option is going to explode in value because it still has five or 10 days. That zero day option though is going to zero. So you can be profitable on both legs. We've done it many times with earnings trades, uh, specifically diagonal spreads where you get an inside move or a move close to the strike. Your short option is zero days though, so it just goes to zero and your long option gains value. That's the best case scenario for these intraday binary events, which is why we're going to use the one day option today, which will be a zero day option tomorrow. We still want to see a big differential in the one day options expected move, which is very easy to see on Tastyworks platform. Um, if you don't have that, you can just look at the implied volatility. We want to see really high implied volatility percentage numbers in the one day relative to the option we're buying. And we have a couple of good examples here uh, that exemplify that. The further out in time we go, just like anything else, the less the extrinsic value will be implied volatility based and it will be more time value in terms of the total extrinsic value there is. So if you can think about it as like an upward slope as you get closer to expiration, that's how all these options are basically priced, but it gets even more insane when you have an intraday binary event like we do tomorrow morning at 7.30 in the morning. So this, this trade, before we talk any further, this trade would have to go on before the end of the day today because this number is yes. going to come out an hour before the market opens tomorrow. Yes. And you'll likely see volatility stay bid through the end of the day. I, don't, I doubt you're going to, you know, you don't have to put this trade on right this second. You're going to see volatility stay high. Totally. Um, all right. So this is the Tastyworks platform. There's about 200 people in here. We love to see it. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Tastyworks platform, you can go to tastyworks.com right now. Uh, they have some cool offers going on. But this is what we're talking about when we're saying looking at the implied volatility number and looking at the, at the expected move. Uh, Tastyworks is my favorite platform to, for organizational purposes, my favorite platform in general, but it just it's just so easy to see what we're talking about. So one day, October 13th, this is the expiration we're using for our short option, which I've highlighted in this reddish salmon color, I, I guess, if you will. 53.3% IV relative to 35, 35, 35, 35 in the back uh, five days, six days, seven days. So these options are still short-term options, but you can clearly see that the implied volatility of these options is baseline relative to this 53%. And when you compare it to the expected move, $8.50 for one day relative to $15.50 for a nine-day option. So there's 900% more days relative to the one day, and you're looking at over 50% of the expected move in the one day relative to the nine. So we want to be, if we're using a short-term option, because if we're just playing the binary event, we still want to use a shorter term, op term option to keep our costs down, but we want to avoid the IV crush. So I wouldn't be using the two-day, which is at 47% with a high expected move. I would be using one of these in this range. So I'm, I'm probably going to use the Monday one, the five-day, um, just because it's, the first one that that uh, is going to help me avoid the IV crush, and uh, it's going to be a lower cost than using a nine day. Mm -hmm. Fair, yeah. Uh, but if you want to go to a nine day to be more conservative, you can totally do that. It's going to be more expensive. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you might be looking at using the Qs too. So the difference between XSP and the Qs or Spy is that the Qs and Spy have, uh, first of all, they're, they're stock settled. So if your short option is in the money, you will be put stock or you ha will have uh, short shares if you have a short call uh, in the case of the, the market going up. We are going to want to avoid that because number one, we're just trading this binary event. And number two, I want to be able to hold this option all the way to the close tomorrow without any implications of taking shares. So XSP is basically SPX with one tenth of the size, which mm -hmm. is perfect. It's the same uh, size as SPY. Exactly. Yep. So it's, no it's shares. Cash settled SPY basically. Yep. And no shares to worry about. Everything's cash settled. Even if your option expires one penny in the money, it's just going to transfer to cash, which is perfect. Yeah. Um, the, the one big difference, sorry to interrupt you again, Mikey, but the one big difference is how XSP trades. It trades in nickels. So each tick 
on the options is going to be five cents. So mm-hmm. you will have a little bit of added slippage. I guess that's kind of just the the uh, cost of doing business versus spy, which you know is going to be penny wide and largely stays penny wide uh, at all times. Yep, and you can see here there's actually there's a bigger differential in the two day. Got to keep this in mind though, two day versus the one day. So if you're doing a diagonal spread or calendar spread, if you get a move towards your short strike, your short strike is going to show losses because you're still going to have one day left and it's going to increase in value. Even if there's a big vol crush, it's going to increase in value if the cues are right up against your short strike, if you're short the two day and long is seven or nine day. So uh, I'm going to be using XSP because it's going to have zero days to go. We can get a move right to the short strike and we'll still be profitable on that short option at expiration, which is tomorrow at the close. Uh, but you can still use some of these other products. This is just to highlight that this still exists. This implied volatility differential still certainly exists in the queues and SPY and whatever general market ETF you're looking at trading. Mm-hmm. So using XSP, uh, XSP is a cash settled product like SPX, but 10 times smaller. It's the same size as SPY. And again, we can hold this through expiration if we want with no share assignment risk, which is huge. Um, we're, I'm going to be looking at a double calendar spread. You can look at single calendar spreads too, but if you're directionally wrong, you are likely going to see losses, especially if you get a, a move to the expected move. Um, calendar spread is a more neutral trade relative to a diagonal spread, and it really is a pure vol crush setup, which we'll show you in a second. Um, But if you do have a directional assumption, like if you think the market's going to rip higher, I would, or lower, I would be using a diagonal spread because Mm -hmm. that's how you can make the most on that assumption if you are right. Um, But if you're wrong, you're going to see bigger losses than a calendar or double calendar because it's just a bigger trade with much more delta and gamma implication. Good stuff. 